hearing of the law of God. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. of James. We have one more chapter to go, and maybe there will be four or five sermons yet in this chapter. This morning we want to read or focus on verses 1 through 6, but we'll read the entire chapter together. So James 5, reading the entire chapter, 
but our focus being this morning, verses 1 through 6. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, Do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth Produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Here ends the reading of the Word of God. Blessed are those who hear the Word of God and keep it. Amen. Well, beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, He's on fire. Many of us have heard that expression before or or said something like that after we have listened to someone speak. He's on fire. Maybe a politician, maybe a radio commentator, maybe a preacher. And whoever it was, they were loud and they were intense and they were making their point very powerfully and very persuasively. Maybe you said after you heard them, boy, that guy was on fire. Maybe they were pleading a particular case. Maybe they were tearing someone apart. Maybe they were crying for justice. Whatever the details, they were so passionate. And we said, wow, they're on fire. Not literally, of course. It's an expression. As we all know, we understand when someone is speaking so earnestly, so intensely. Well, here in our text in James chapter 5, verse 1 to 6, here is James, and we can say, he's on fire. He's on fire in these opening verses in chapter 5. He's on fire as he's addressing rich people. Very likely, very likely these were not rich members of the congregation. We say that because of the transition from verse 6 to verse 7, James will go from addressing the rich to addressing the brethren. Be patient, brethren, he will say. And so it seems that the rich people in view are the rich people of this world. 
James is addressing them, and whether they ever hear, whether they ever heard him, we don't know. But in any case, he is speaking to them, and he is doing so very intensely. Come now, you rich, he says. Come now. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Again, he's on fire. This is no casual conversation at a cafe. No, this is the servant of the Lord launching a rhetorical attack on rich oppressors, the wealthy ungodly. Probably in James's day, the landowners, the landlords, people who could, with a wave of the hand, as it were, decide the fall and the fate of many. The world is full of people like that still, ungodly oppressors, wealthy, powerful men and women, lots of money, lots of influence, and they're not good people many times. We may think of different examples, people in politics, people in business, people in media, landlords. Just think of what happens when Twitter doesn't like you, or Facebook, or YouTube, and off you go, off their sight, into the dark, out of their store. We can debate whether they should do that, but the point is they're doing it. That's only one illustration. The world is full of people like this. And many times they are dangerous and they are wicked. And many times they seem to succeed. And increasingly, we may think that their wrath and their revenge is directed at us. I mean now the Christian church. The confessing people of the Lord Jesus Christ directed all of this animosity, all of this vehemence, all of this negativity, all of it, not very nice, not very safe, and we may tremble as we, as we feel it being focused towards us. But God word, God's Word speaks into this very situation, and God's Word speaks to those who are oppressing others, also God's people. And God's Word, when it comes in this context, it comes with holy fury and fire. Come now, you rich, weep, and how? We need to hear these words, and we need to learn from them. And they're, meant also, they're meant also to be for great comfort and encouragement to the true people of God. Let us listen, therefore, this morning. Let us listen as God addresses the wealthy ungodly. Come now, you rich. That's the way James starts. And let's notice, first of all, the lifestyle. That's a problem. Our first point, the lifestyle, that's a problem. Because it's not that the people are rich, that's the problem. Let's be clear about that. The Bible never condemns, never says it is wrong to be rich as such. But what do people do with their riches? How do people handle being so well off? And what we find in our text, what we find is four particular issues, four particular sins of these rich people here. And they're very serious. Here's the first one. Hoarding. The rich people are hoarding their riches. Notice verse 2 and 3. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. So these people, they have heaped up their wealth. And it is all for themselves, and they are keeping it close to themselves. They were hoarding what they had received. James points to three categories of wealth. First one is a general category described as riches in verse 2. Your riches. And we can presume that Probably that's a reference to food especially, abundance of food. And we say that because James says your riches are corrupted or literally decayed or rotting. One of the signs of the wealthy is that their pantries are full. 
With these people, James is saying, your pantries are so full. And of course, this is long before preservatives and refrigeration as we know it today. But even today, if you, if you pile up too much meat or too much vegetables, too much food that you can't use it all in a reasonable frame of time, what can happen? It can rot. And so it was happening in the time of our text. These rich people heaped up so much food, an abundance of good food, and there was so much that there was waste, lots of waste. It molded, so much of it rotted away. Another category of riches is clothing. And James says about clothing that it is moth-eaten. So it's like these people had closets of clothes. No doubt expensive clothes, top of the line, wardrobes, outfit after outfit, more even than they could ever wear in a reasonable period of time, and as can happen still today, happened then also, moths got into their clothes and eventually they ruined their clothes. Maybe you know too, when you don't wear something for a long, long time, maybe because you have so much to wear, and someday you pull out that item of clothing and you see, oh, it's not in very good shape anymore. It's ruined. And so it was for these people. And then another category still, gold and silver. And James says, your gold and silver are corroded, which, of course, can't really happen to true gold and silver, but it's an image. It's a picture of the worthlessness of accumulated wealth. What's the point of a bank vault full of money? If the money just sits there all the time, sits there, and it's not spent, not used, also in the service of others, not given to help those who are in need. But that is what these rich people were doing. They were hoarding food, clothes, money. They were getting more and more for themselves. And maybe they were thinking that thereby they could purchase their safety and security. All this abundance they heaped up for themselves. And meanwhile, the implication is there was no sharing. There was no care and concern for their fellow man, for the poor and needy. What a sin it is to hoard wealth. What a sin to lay up treasures here on earth where moth and rust can corrupt and where thieves can break in and steal. What a sin when we take what God gives us and we keep it only for ourselves, keep it all tucked nice and neat in our own little corner and don't use it in the way that God intended us to use it for His glory and for the good of others. But then there's another issue. That comes up in verse 4. So hoarding was one problem. But now verse 4. Indeed, the weight is of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud. So hoarding was an issue. Fraud was another. These rich landowners employed servants, laborers, field workers, reapers. Just think of some of the parables Jesus told, like the one about the rich landowner who went out in the morning and at six o'clock, hired some workers, and then at nine, some more, and twelve, some more, three, some more, still at five, some more. And then at the end of the day, he paid them all. But these rich landowners didn't pay. That's the point now. They kept the wages back, and they did so by fraud. We don't know the details of that. Maybe they made some excuse. Maybe at the end of the day, they said, sorry, we didn't make it to the bank today. We'll pay you tomorrow. Or maybe they, didn't just sh- maybe they didn't bother to show up when it was the end of the day and the workers had to finish their work and go home without the boss around at all. Or maybe they, they, they used some kind of loophole that they had devised. However they did it. However they did it, they did it. They kept back these wages of their employees and they wouldn't pay them. Way back in Deuteronomy 24, Deuteronomy 24, verse 14 and 15, the Lord had something to say about this. You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy. Each day you shall give him his wages, and not let the sun go down on it, for he is poor and has set his heart on it. So a timely payment of your employees is the principle that's being set out here. But it's not being followed. Can you imagine the weary husbands and fathers when they got home to their families and their wives said, how was it? How was your day? 
And the men said, it was hard. Of course it was hard. But the worst is we've got nothing to show for it. What do you mean you've got nothing to show for it? The boss wouldn't pay us. What a trial for those families. What a burden. Think of the children in those homes going hungry. No food. No money to buy clothes. No way to heat their homes. Back in Deuteronomy, the Lord had said to employers, you shall not do this. It's a sin. And it was a sin being committed by these rich oppressors in the time of James. Hoarding. Fraud. But then another issue comes in verse 5. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. So here's a picture of gross self-indulgence. These rich people lived to pamper and satisfy and delight themselves alone. You know, it's not wrong to enjoy the good things of this world as God gives them, but it is wrong when that's our only goal in life. It is wrong when we live solely for ourselves, never mind the needs of others. It is wrong when we cannot be bothered ever to give up some of our comforts and wealth to share with others or to serve others. And it seems these rich people in James's time, they were doing exactly this. They were living in total devotion to their own lusts and desires. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. And that's all. So no community service. At least not true community service. Maybe they helped and served each other. They were like a, 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 a niche unto themselves, all the rich people. But no true community service, no care for those in need, no tithing for the church and service of God. Life was entirely about them, their toys, their parties, their happiness. The supreme focus of their life was to glorify themselves and to enjoy themselves. Self-indulgence was everything. What a shame when someone lives a self-indulgent life. What a shame and what a waste. And then there's one more issue James describes in verse 6. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. And so here the lifestyle turns dark. It was already dark with the reference to fraud and to stealing. But now the stealing seems to have turned into killing. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Now, not too many details here. We don't know if this was a court of law reference. Did the rich people bring charges against the poorer people? Or did they have their own militia that would go around and take care of those who were a problem? It's hard to know. What's clear is that they were extreme. And what's also clear is that their targets were many times the people of God. You have murdered the just. That has to be a reference to the Christians. So what is happening here is that the rich oppressors were targeting the Christians, often the poor Christians. And they were finding ways to accuse them falsely. No doubt the charges had to be trumped up because these people were just. They were righteous. But the rich in power, the rich called the shots, the rich pulled all the strings, and the rich were finding ways to take out the people of God. It must have been a very, very difficult time for the church. But now James is addressing these rich people and their lifestyle. And he is highlighting how their lifestyle is a problem. Now it was the rich people in our text. It was the lifestyle of the people in our text. But we know well, don't we, that it's still happening today with the rich of this world. And of course, it's not only the rich people that can fall into these sins. Isn't it true that riches or, or, or simply the desire for riches can so often lead to this kind of life, can, can so often bring out this kind of, bring, bring out what lives in our heart. It's like what Paul writes elsewhere when he addresses Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. Those who desire to be rich, he says in verse 9, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. 
But the tragic truth of that has been lived out by generations of people. And James here is pointing out to us what a problem that kind of life is. On multiple fronts, that's true. Riches never save people. Many times, riches lead to a whole lifestyle of wickedness. We can't miss that in the text as James lifts up these issues of hoarding, fraud, self-indulgence, and murder. And the entire lifestyle is an outrage and a disgrace. And just by the way, let's learn from all of this for ourselves. Let's learn ourselves to be so careful regarding riches and the desire for riches. If we think of how much we all have in life. Of how much more we can sometimes want or seek after. Sometimes so intensely. And the dangers involved in that. And the importance of being watchful over our own hearts. Riches can be such a problem. Can be so deadly. In fact, they can even lead to our destruction. Let's hear that from James regarding these rich people in our text. Going to our next point, not only the lifestyle that's a problem, but secondly, the judgment that is surely coming. The judgment. The judgment that is surely coming. Really, this is the heart and center of the passage. We hear it in the first verse. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. It's a shocking direction, isn't it? Weep and howl. That word howl is a word that describes what you do when you experience tremendous pain. Think of what might happen if you broke all your ribs and your back and and more even. Or or, or think of what it's like to undergo great emotional pain when, when you lose loved ones. Sometimes tragically, weeping can be so intense then and and something of that is here weep and howl so here are these rich people and they were living in ultimate comfort and abundance and security and peace and james says to them do you not know you should be weeping do you not understand that you ought to be howling because miseries are coming you think everything is fine today and maybe it is but if you could just see what is around the corner If you could just know what is about to fall upon you and consume you. If you could just see it, you would cry out. You would scream in absolute terror. And you should be doing so even now. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. James is saying fearful judgment. Don't you understand? He carries on with that in the rest of the passage. Verse 3. The corrosion of your gold and silver will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. So the money you hoarded in your pocket, you kept so close to yourself, someday it will burn right through you. Burn right through your pocket, right through your wallet. Burn even your own flesh. It's a picture. It's meant to convey judgment. Notice too the last words of verse 3. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. That's an ominous word. It's a reference to the fact that from God's perspective, we are living in the last age of the world. We're not living in the first days. These are not the opening days of creation. These are the last. These are the culminating days of creation. And that means judgment is coming. And that means we are close to the time when all people will stand before God and will give account of their life how they have conducted themselves in this world. Every one of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And for believers, as we know, what will make all the difference is that we are covered by the blood and righteousness of Christ. What will make all the difference for the child of God is that they are safe in the arms of Jesus Christ. Fundamentally, no one is different from any other. We all have evil, wicked hearts. We are all capable of tremendous sin. But if we are protected by the saving work of Christ, we will survive the judgment. We will stand in that great day. But just think what it will be for those who are without Christ. Think what it will be for those who have lived like the rich people in our text. Here they were just living it up. Living it up. But James says these are the last days. And all the chapters of this world are about to wrap up and conclude. And then... Well, James carries on in this way in verse 4. 
regarding the cries of the reapers who didn't get paid because the rich bosses defrauded them. Notice the end of verse 4. The cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. This is a most solemn text, fearful text for everyone who has cheated someone out of what they have earned. Everyone who has robbed and stolen from the poor and needy. Everyone who has taken advantage of someone or abused someone. The cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You know, this is exactly what God said would happen. Way back in Exodus 22, verse 22 and 23, the Lord warned His people, if you afflict anyone, especially the vulnerable and the defenseless, if you afflict them in any way and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry. Those cries will enter into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. So just notice that the Lord hears every cry for help. Every time the oppressed of his people moan and groan under the weight of the oppression, he hears. That should make every oppressor, every cheat, every bully, every abuser, that should make everyone pause and consider, God is marking all of this down. So I can go and hurt someone. And I can go on with my life and think it doesn't make any difference. I got away with it. But that someone whom I have heard goes on their knees and says, Lord, help. And those words go all the way up into heaven and right into the ears of the living God. And not just the living God, but the Lord of Sabaoth. The God who is a man of war. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. The one who has legions of angels at his beck and call and he has but to give the word and they will come and they will do all his will. You know there is no one who can stand against the Lord of Sabaoth. This is Christ ultimately. Christ the King is over all and he sees all and he will judge all. When he comes to the defense of the reapers who cry out against their unjust employers, against all oppressors, oh, how fearful that will be for them. Just see that yet in verse 5. You have fattened your hearts. Verse 5, you have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. So the picture here is of animals in the fields that have been well fed. It's been a good year. But unknown to them, it's all in anticipation of the day when they will be taken to the slaughterhouse. Animals fattened for slaughter. And James says to these rich, ungodly, wicked, oppressing people, this is the picture of your life. Here you are living it up and you think you are living so well. But the reality is you are simply getting fat for the day of the divine slaughter. And the imagery is vivid and violent. And it is a prophecy of the destruction of the wicked. Judgment is coming, surely coming. And it will mean the end of all the the ungodly, including all the rich ungodly, all the powerful ungodly. Fatten your hearts for slaughter. Well, all of this we know, don't we? This whole point we know. Because every Sunday, we confess as congregation, as one of, one of our articles of faith, Christ is coming to judge the living and the dead. We know this. But James is bringing it out here to these rich people in a way that is so powerful, so concrete, so specific and so terrifying. And the great question, the great question at this point is why? Why is James doing this? Why is he speaking so, so intensely, so on fire in his way to these rich people? To answer that question, let's go to our last point this morning. 
Come now, you rich. The lifestyle that's in view, the judgment that's surely coming, and lastly, the reason for this passage. The reason, as you listen to this message and to our text, can you think of what might be the reason for these fiery words? Maybe someone listening says, is this James confronting these rich people with their sins so that they might be called to repentance? Is that what this is about? Is, is James saying, come now you rich, and laying into them that they might be convicted so that they might be converted? Well, if you think that way, that's not a bad guess. I thought that too at first. In fact, initially I even titled this point, The Call to Repentance Meant to be Heard. But then I read John Calvin's opening remarks on this passage. And not that John Calvin knows everything, but he stopped me short when he said this, and I quote him. Calvin says, They are mistaken who consider that James here exhorts the rich to repentance. I had to read that again. They are mistaken who consider that James here exhorts the rich to repentance. In other words, that's not what this is about. It's not a call to repentance. So that sends us back to the text and to review what is this text saying. And as Calvin goes on to say, and I think rightly so, this passage is a simple denunciation of God's judgment by which he meant to terrify them without giving them any hope of pardon. Now just to be clear about this, it's not as if there is no hope for rich sinners. It's not as if someone who's rich and who has maybe, maybe led a life like our text describes, it's not like if they come to us and they say, what do we do to be saved? That we say to them, sorry, you can't be saved. No, that's not the point. Any sinner who's convicted by the word of God, any sinner who says, oh no, I'm in trouble now, I need to be saved and delivered, what do I do? With any and every sinner under conviction, we point them to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We tell them to run to Christ. And we say to them, look to him and be saved. That's always true. Till Jesus returns, that's always, always true. Of course, it's also true that for rich people, especially Jesus said, it's hard to be saved. Maybe you remember that in Mark 10. It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Because riches can be such a drag on our souls. And once we have them and or if we, if we are infected with a love for them and a trust in them, to lose that is so difficult. In fact, it is impossible even apart from God. And if we ever stubbornly hold fast to our riches and they corrupt us and we begin to embrace the lifestyle that's described in our text, maybe there can be a point when it is too late for us. Someday it will be too late. But all of that now is really beside the point. Because James is not addressing the question of whether or not the rich people who have lived in sin, even terrible sin, can be saved or not. When you study the text, James never says to them here, you need to turn from your sin. You need to seek mercy with God and Jesus Christ. James never says anything like that. The only direction he gives to them is weep, howl. James does not call these people to repentance because that's not the issue James is addressing. That's not why he has written these passionate words. Let's remember, James is writing to the church. And the rich people he is speaking about and even speaking to are probably not not in the church. At least they were not true members of the church. They were not part of the brethren or the beloved brethren. They were the oppressors of the brethren. It's very likely that these rich people never even heard what James had to say. But even if they never heard, here's the point. The people of God heard. The people to whom James is writing this whole letter, they heard, or we might say they overheard James denouncing the rich. And no doubt that is the point. No doubt James says what he says here. Especially for the comfort and for the encouragement of God's people. Because let's remember, it was very likely these believers who were suffering under the oppression of these rich, ungodly, wicked people. 
It was very likely some of the believers who were not getting paid by their bosses. It was very likely some of these believers who were being targeted for condemnation and murder. Who knows even how many of them had lost loved ones already through being murdered by the rich. The people were suffering. And if you think of what that must have been like and how they must have struggled and wondered, where is our God? Does He see? Does He care? And James speaks these words in the main to convey to the people of the Lord, listen, the rich will not get away with what they are doing. Never envy them, people of God. And especially, never despair when at their mercy. God will take care of everything. God knows everything that is happening. And God, the Lord of Sabaoth, the King of kings, will make everything right. James will go on in verse 7 and following to make this very clear. But already in his fiery admonition of the rich here in 1-6, to the point, the reason is to assure the people of God that in the midst of all the oppression, all the injustice, all the suffering, there's a God who sees, who measures, who knows, and who will address it all. And while the rich oppressors might seem to get away with it for now, in the end they cannot, and they will not. And what they might not hear now, these rich people, they will someday may be, be made to hear as the Lord of Sabaoth compels them to appear before His throne and He will judge them and He will destroy them. And oh, how they will weep and how they will howl. And to think of that should make us be very compassionate to those who live in darkness and live out their darkness. And at the same time, to be very comforted. Our God will make all things right. So that seems to be then the reason for this passage. And isn't it a relevant message today? Yes, today, as we sometimes wonder, what is going on in this world? What really is going on? And who can know? And who is able to say? And sometimes from our perspective, it seems like the, the wicked are winning. What will happen this week in the United States from a human perspective, from a, a church perspective, seems like a very dark turn for the people of God. And how often the ungodly can seem to be on top. And the church left to struggle. And the believers suffer. And we may wonder how come that's so. And we may say, where is Christ? Where is the one who is said to have all power in heaven and on earth? And this passage assures us, He's here. He sees it all. And He will deal with it. Oh, He most certainly will deal with it. If you are still His enemy today, you need to surrender to Him right now. And all of us who are his friends by his grace. Let's be encouraged. Let's be strong. And let's wait patiently for our God. Amen. Let us pray. O sovereign Lord, Lord of Sabaoth, we have heard you through James denounce the rich the ungodly, the oppressors of your people. And we have considered also that way of life, that way of life that can be a temptation to all of us, to hoard, to defraud, to live in self-indulgence, and even to murder. We know that this world is adept at all these things. We can think perhaps of people or of organizations or of whole nations that excel at all of this. It's the way of sin. It's the way of evil. It's the way of ungodliness. We pray, Lord, that we may see it 
in a way that we abhor it, in a way that we ourselves turn from it, even with all the abundance you have given us in our time and place, that we would live very carefully and in a godly manner, in a way that has all the evidence pointing to the fact that our home is in heaven, our heart is in heaven. And when, Lord, we may see the wicked prosper, and when we may even be oppressed by the wicked. We pray, Lord, that we may take comfort and encouragement from this passage. You know what is happening. You are keeping a record of all that is happening. And someday, you will call everyone to account. What a terrible day it will be for all the ungodly. How they will weep. How they will howl. We pray as we think of that, Lord, we may be filled with compassion for those maybe who are living out their wickedness also in animosity towards us. We may pray yet for their conversion if it can be your will. And if not, Lord, and if we should be made to suffer, we pray that we may do so patiently. We pray that we may do so quietly. We pray that we may do so in a way that is confident. You will make all things right. You will make all things well. Help us, Lord, by way of your word. If we are far from you, teach us to surrender to you. And let all your people ever and always trust in you. Remember us further in this day. Forgive our sins and hear our prayer. Hear our cries. In Jesus' name.